second is a welcoming speech from the Faculty of Pharmacy University of Indonesia. And the third one is our main uh, agenda, which is lecture from our speaker, Professor Ryan. And the fourth is question and answering and question. And the last one is a closing. Okay, uh, dear audience, now we are going, uh, before we start, we are going to take picture first. So would you mind to turn on uh, the camera, please? Yeah. Maybe we can take a picture. So please to all audience to open the camera, to turn on the camera. And maybe I would like to ask some help from the committee to guide this photo session. Maybe Mr. Arif. Okay. Okay. For the first page, one, two, sorry, wait. Um, okay. One, two, three. Next, one, two, three. The last one, one, two, three. Okay, done. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Arif. Okay, uh, thank you. We are going to the next agenda, which is a welcoming speech from our Dean, Faculty of Pharmacy, University of Indonesia, Dr. Mahdi Jufri. Dr. Mahdi Jufri, the time is yours, please. Thank you, Ibu Ratika. Good morning to Professor Rian Donnelly from University of Belfast, UK, Queens. Uh, honorable to Vice Dean, Academic Research and Student Affair, or Ari Anwar, Vice Dean of the Human Resources and Adventure and General Administration, Professor Abdul Munim, all manager, all head of study program of Faculty of Pharmacy, all professor, lecturer, and other student student. Uh, this afternoon, we will hear a guest lecture about Micronil. As we know, we uh, Micronil is a, a drug delivery system and uh, have a promising to the delivery of a drug or vaccine maybe. We hope with this guest lecture, we can continue in the future collaboration between the, about the student exchange Staff research collaboration within the Queen Belfast University. I will to thanks to all committee which prepared this event running well. On behalf of Dean Faculty Pharmacy, I officially open this webinar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Mahdi Jufri, for the welcoming speech. So now we are going to our main agenda, which is lecture from uh, Ryan Donnelly and with the topic of needles. So this session will be led by our moderator, which is Dr. Deli Ramadan. Uh, however, before we start, allow me to introduce briefly about our moderator. Dr. Deli Ramadan obtained his undergraduate degree and master degree from University of Indonesia and he obtained PhD degree in Transdermal Technology from Queen's University, Belfast in 2020 under supervision of Professor Ryan. Until now, he has 18 publications in Scopus Index International Journals, and his recent research paper published in 2020 also received an award from the Ministry of Research and Technology of Republic of Indonesia as the high quality scientific articles in the field of health and medicine. Currently, he is uh, the secretary of postgraduate program at Faculty of Pharmacy University of Indonesia. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Deli to lead the lecture session. Dr. Deli Ramadan, the floor is yours. Thank you, please. Yeah, thanks very much indeed for the chance, uh, Ms. Rotika, as the master of ceremony of this guest lecture. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning to Professor Ryan Donnelly in Belfast. So my name is Deli, and I'll be your moderator for this online guest lecture. But before we begin our guest lecture, let me read Professor Donnelly's CV. So Professor Ryan Donnelly graduated with BSc first class 
in pharmacy from Queen's University Belfast in 1999. Following a year of pre-registration training spent in community pharmacy, he returned to the School of Pharmacy to undertake a PhD in pharmaceutics. He graduated in 2003 and after a short period of postdoctoral research was appointed to a lectureship in pharmaceutics in January, 2004. He was promoted to senior lecturer in 2009, reader in 2011, and in 2013 to a chair in pharmaceutical technology or professor. Professor Donnelly's research is centered on the design and physical chemical characterization of advanced polymeric drug delivery system for transdermal and topical drug delivery with a strong emphasis on improving therapeutic outcomes for patients. Currently, Professor Donnelly's research is focused on novel polymeric microneedle arrays for transdermal administration of difficult to deliver drugs and intradermal delivery of vaccines and photosensitizer. His work is funded by BBSRC, EPSRC, MRC, the Wellcome Trust, the Royal Society, and the pharmaceutical and medical devices industries. He has authored over 600 peer-reviewed publications, including several granted patents, six textbooks, and approximately 260 full papers. He has been an invited speaker at numerous national and international conferences. Professor Donnelly is also a member of the Editorial Advisory Board of Journal of Controlled Release, Micromachines, and Expert Review of Medical Devices. He is a board member of the Academy of Pharmaceutical Sciences and the Communications Chair of the Control Release Society. His work has attracted numerous awards, including the Academy of Pharmaceutical Sciences Innovative Science Award in 2020, the Control Release Society Young Investigator Award in 2016, BBSRC Innovator of the Year in 2013, the GSK Emerging Scientist Award in 2012, and the Royal Pharmaceutical Society Science Award in 2011. So please welcome our honorable speaker, Professor Ryan Donnelly. To Professor Donnelly, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deli, and it's nice to see everybody. I'm going to just share my screen, um, if I can manage to do that. Um, so the host um, has disabled participant yeah. screen sharing, so I'll need somebody to give me control. I think you, you, you can share it now, Ryan. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Deli. No Thanks. worries. Okay, so hopefully people can see my screen okay. You can see that, Debbie? Very good. It, it, Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let us see. So there we go. So um, thanks, everybody, for your very kind invitation to speak to you. And I really must apologize for getting the times wrong on our previous scheduled lecture. Um, I foolishly... Um, thought that the lecture was at 7 p.m. Belfast time. Um, but whenever I talk to my Indonesian PhD students and postdoc in the lab, they reminded me that that would have been in the middle of the night in Indonesia. So I, I'm really grateful to, to Delhi, um, and the Dean and, and all of the academics and, and um, the participants of our meeting that they've had the patience to come back and, and listen to me. And, and I remembered to turn up this time. So, so many apologies and, and thank you for your patience. Um, I'm going to talk to you, as, as Delhi said, um, about microneedles for drug and vaccine delivery. Uh, my presentations will have a number of different um, aspects. So I'm going to start off talking to you about conventional microneedle strategies. I'm then going to say that if we change our mindset, then we can consider delivery of high doses, particularly of poorly water soluble drugs. Traditionally, microneedles have been focused on vaccines, of course. To deliver high doses, then there are a number of design and manufacture considerations that we need to take into account. And I'm going to go into detail on these, particularly for dissolving microneedles. And finally, as the work in my group um, aims to improve therapeutic outcomes for patients, I will consider the various different patient and translational considerations. 
So as the name suggests, microneedles are arrays of tiny projections on a solid support. They can be various different shapes and they can be made from a lot of different materials, including metal, glass, ceramic, and polymer. What they do have in common is that they tend to be less than one millimeter in height. Um, and they tend to be formed on small patches, less than one or two square centimeters. And what microneedles do then is to painlessly penetrate the stratum corneum barrier of the skin, creating aqueous pores. Now, microneedles are very small. And if we're only using one square centimeter, then we can probably only deliver very potent substances. So things like vaccines, um, very potent molecules like insulin, or um, deliver medicines locally into, for example, a skin tumor. Um, typically, the drugs that microneedles are used um, to deliver tend to be very water soluble. And the reason for this, of course, is that the microneedles are creating aqueous filled pores in the skin. But I actually think we can do much more than this. Um, You'll all have seen um, over the, the last terrible year that we've all endured um, several papers, no doubt, um, focusing on different routes of delivery of COVID-19 vaccines. And microneedles have been quite prominent in this. And as I said at the beginning, microneedles have traditionally been used um, for vaccine delivery, you know, probably with good reason, because microneedles are a, a solid state um, system. So this may mean that you can preserve um, a vaccine in a microneedle system, even at, at quite high ambient temperatures as might be seen in sub-Saharan Africa. And so the stability might be improved relative to a needle and syringe based liquid vaccine that probably has to be refrigerated. And then vaccines can be administered with microneedles um, without a needle and syringe. So there's no risk of needle stick injuries and they could be administered by someone with minimal health training. Now I can certainly see um, for a range of different vaccines in the developing world that microneedles would have a big, big advantage um, over a needle and syringe in terms of stability, safety and disposal. But people in, in developing countries aren't going to be able to pay for the technology innovation and it, it's undoubted that microneedles will probably be more expensive than needle and syringe vaccines at least at the beginning. Um, and so we probably need Bill and Melinda Gates or some other charitable organization to pay for the development of those vaccines, which actually the Gates Foundation has done for a measles and rubella um, microneedle vaccine that they hope to take right through to the clinic um, for children in developing countries. Now in, um, in more developed countries, then I think that over the next year or two, maybe longer, there's going to be a considerable um, catch up period where all of the treatment and diagnoses that were put off due to the COVID crisis are going to have to get done. Um, and we also are probably looking at everybody needing vaccinated on maybe an annual basis against COVID-19 and, and its variants. So what this means is that um, conventional healthcare is going to be very, very busy. And it might be better if medicines that were normally given by injection in a doctor or, or nurse's office could instead be administered by a person in their own home. So I'm thinking about any long acting injections for, for example, contraception, for management of schizophrenia, um, and also for, for certain other diseases like HIV, which is where my group has a big, big interest. So if we want to deliver high dose hydrophobic drugs using microneedles, we need to remember that the microneedles create aqueous pores in the skin. And if our drug's not very water soluble, then what can we do about that? The other thing is for most drugs, we need tens or hundreds of milligrams as a dose. Now that dose may not be a daily dose, but it could be a dose that would be given once a week or once a month, but still it's much higher than the dose of a vaccine or insulin where we need maybe tens of micrograms. 
And if we have to deliver a high dose of a drug, then what implications does that have for the size of the patch? So we can't have a patch that's the size of a person's torso. We need something that's similar in size to a conventional transdermal patch. Now, even at that, if we have a big patch, can people apply those? And what happens if they repeatedly apply microneedles to their own skin on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis? Because remember, we're, we're puncturing the skin barrier. I do think that um, as microneedle manufacture continues to develop, and, and I'm working with LTS Lohman, the world's biggest transdermal patch manufacturer, and they have now have Europe's first and only um, manufacturing license for microneedles, I think cost will come down in terms of manufacture. And I think that this um, will lead to competitive advantages for industry. So if we can now deliver medicines into and across the skin that we could never do before, um, then there are many benefits. But really as a pharmacist, I want to see benefits for patients. And I think these can be considerable. So let's think about how we might load microneedles with a high dose of drug. So. We want to make sure because the microneedles maybe on a one square centimeter patch only weigh about 10 milligrams, we want to make sure we've got a lot of drug in there. So the drug loading in the, the actual shafts of the needle needs to be greater than 50%. We also need to remember that we're depositing polymer as well as drug in the person's skin. So the, the matrix polymer of the microneedles has to be biodegradable or low molecular weight so that we don't get accumulation in the body. The polymer itself has to be a good film former, and it has, has to have a low glass transition temperature because we want our microneedles to be hard and sharp and penetrate the stratum corneum. Because we're casting these microneedles from aqueous gels, um, we can dry them slowly, and that's a good thing. Um, because if we dry too fast, we can trap the drug temporarily in the amorphous state. And that will gradually recrystallize upon storage. And that means that the physical properties of the microneedle and the release properties of the drug will change upon storage. And we have to avoid that. Now, obviously, if we make microneedles that are longer or of a different shape, <clears throat> then we can potentially get more drug in there. So we can influence the, the geometry. In this case, microneedles are really just a tool to put the real delivery system, which in this case would be the insoluble drug particles that would then slowly dissolve in the skin interstitial fluid and get absorbed by the dermal microcirculation. Um, so the, the, the drug and particle characteristics are important and we should control those. Because we're probably delivering a purely soluble molecule in high amounts, then we're unlikely to deliver anything that's in the base plate or the part of the needle that doesn't penetrate the stratum corneum. Um, and this is, is obviously because the fluid that is in the skin is aqueous fluid and it will only dissolve the matrix of the needles, but it's not going to be able to dissolve the base plate and miraculously suck particle um, drug down into the skin. So that means we don't need to put drug in the base plate. This should hopefully also avoid any sticky drug or polymer residue on the surface of the skin whenever the patch is removed. So here we can just see dissolving microneedles with a high amount of drug dissolving in the skin within 15 minutes. And the drug is then deposited in the skin for a, a sustained effect. So the first disease that I'm going to talk about today is HIV AIDS. So since the beginning of the epidemic in the early 1980s, more than 33 million people have died due to HIV infection. And even in 2019, um, there were still 38 million people living worldwide with the disease, and there were 150,000 new infections in children that year. The vast majority of people who are living with HIV are in low and middle income countries. The good news is that in 2019, 21.7 million people, um, which is 67% of those living with HIV, were actually accessing antiretroviral therapy. And this therapy has been um, profound. In impact. I'm sorry? 
Okay. And sorry, I think it just leaked the sound. No problem, Ryan. Go ahead, please. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Daddy. So, um, the impact of, of antiretroviral therapy has been profound. Um, so, what this means is that somebody with HIV can actually have a normal lifespan um, and it can prevent them from passing the disease on to others. But the person must continue to take the medicine. Due to antiretroviral therapy, new infections fell by 39% in the 20 years to 2019, and deaths fell by 51%, with 15.3 million lives saved due to antiretroviral therapy. There is a considerable pill burden, though people are taking one or more tablets or capsules every day, and this can have a psychological effect on people, so much so that they may discontinue the treatment. And this can lead to disease relapse and also development of resistance um, to medication. So one alternative um, treatment would be to give a long acting injection. Um, and we can do this um, if we deliver two drugs for treatment or one drug to prevent um, transmission. Um, if someone is engaging in risky sexual behavior or intravenous drug use, they're at high risk of getting HIV. Um, so you can give them one drug um, with a long acting injection once a month, and this will prevent them from getting HIV. So the person can more or less live a normal life, whether they're preventing or they're being treated for, for HIV, but they still need this painful intramuscular injection once a month. Now, this is okay if you've got a, a good healthcare system and um, you can do it, even if it's unpleasant and inconvenient for the patient. But in developing countries, there's a lack of skilled healthcare workers. There's a lot of needle stick injuries and needles are often disposed of improperly. So microneedles would have a big advantage in delivery of long acting HIV drugs. So what we need to do is we need to take the drug as a crystalline nano suspension. Um, so get the drug and essentially grind it down to form nanoparticles, put those into the microneedles, put them into a mold um, and um, allow the microneedles to dry and then add a border adhesive and an occlusive backing layer to form your micro array patch. And the base plate should readily detach upon microneedle dissolution in skin and the nanoformulated drug then will exhibit sustained release and absorption by the rich dermal microcirculation. So the first example we have of this is some work we did with Janssen's Rilpivirine nano suspension. So we took the injection and we, we turned it into a microneedle patch and we applied that to the skin of rats. And in comparison, then we gave an intramuscular injection of the long acting um, Rilpivirine nano suspension. And in both cases, then we followed the plasma levels and vaginal tissue levels for 56 days. Now, the reason we looked at vaginal tissue was, of course, because HIV transmission is most common through heterosexual intercourse, actually. And what we found was that the microneedles had comparable um, plasma and vaginal tissue levels over the 56 days to the intramuscular injection. So the microneedles perform just as well as the injection. Now, ordinarily, we would, would be able to do allometric scaling from uh, a rat to a human in terms of working out the patch size quite easily. Um, the challenge that we have um, with a long acting drug is that they tend to exhibit um, flip flop pharmacokinetics. So, in other words, the absorption phase is so slow because the drug dissolves so slowly that it is what governs the overall plasma exposure um, or the area under the curve rather than the elimination kinetics. So this means that we can't easily do allometric scaling, um, but we can use some computer simulation to try and work out what the patch size might be for a person. And in this case, we make a very conservative estimate that the patch size for seven days human treatment might be somewhere between 25 and 30 square centimeters. So it's quite big, but it's, it's within the range of a normal transdermal patch. And we've actually been able to make patches of that size in our work. 
So if we wanted to reduce dosing frequency or reduce pack size, one thing we could do is we could make the needles longer, but we can't make them any longer than about one millimeter or the person will feel pain and will cause pinprick bleeds underneath the skin and we want to avoid that. So if just for example, you moved from the normal 600 micrometer conical or pyramidal needles to 800 micrometer cylindrical structures with quadrilateral tips, then you can actually double your drug loading. Um, where I really think though we're gonna have success is to choose more potent drugs. Um, so the likes of Rilpivirine needs a dose of somewhere between 400 and 600 milligrams a month. So if you had a more potent molecule, then your patch size will come down. So these are, are, are some patches of a new design that we made um, with these um, cuboidal bases and pyramidal heads. I were able to get about six milligrams of Vive Healthcare's Cabotegravir into those needles. We then decided to use this needle design um, for another HIV drug, Etravirine. Um, so this was work done um, by uh, a colleague, Satish, who came to, to visit us from, from India, and Delhi knows him and his, his stories about his university very well. Um, what we um, looked at here was not only the nano suspension of etrovirine, but also we just took the powder form straight out of the bottle, mixed it with a gel and made microneedles. And the reason we did that was nano suspensions can be quite energy intensive and so quite expensive to actually produce. So what we wanted to do then was we wanted to compare an intravenous injection of the soluble form of etrovirine with the long acting um, microneedle form, either the nano suspension or the powder form. So understandably what we found in the plasma levels in the rats was that when we give the drug intravenously in the soluble form, we got a massive peak um, in terms of the plasma level. And that fell down then within about 10 days to virtually nothing. So the drug didn't stay in the body for a long period of time. But when we deposited the drug in the intradermal space using the microneedles, both the powder form and the nano suspension form gave long acting kinetics, such that after a month, we still had therapeutic plasma levels in the rat. So we think that the microneedles are looking pretty promising. And the fact that we don't even have to make a nano suspension means that production could be done more conveniently and more cheaply. So we took these learnings in to look at cabotegravir. Again, we took the Vive Healthcare um, long acting injection and we gave that um, intramuscularly or intradermally into the skin. And then we had three different types of microneedles. So we took the injection and we turned that into a long acting or LA microneedle. We then took the powder form of the free acid form of cabotegravir and put that into microneedles. And then we took the more sodium soluble sodium salt and put that into the microneedles as well. And we compared the plasma levels over 28 days. And what we actually found was that after seven days, the um, more soluble sodium salt had performance that was um, actually comparable to the injections, which was really, really promising. We think that a week in a rat is probably close to being a month in a person for this drug substance. So this is very promising. But even the other two microneedle systems after 28 days still had um, levels that were above this four times protein adjusted IC90 concentration, which is basically the therapeutic concentration of cabotegravir. So we have something that I think is very promising in the long acting management of HIV. Here we think the patch size um, would probably be in and around um, 20 to 30 square centimeters for the seven days um, in a human. And again, I think that that's something that is realistic to make and also for a person to apply. So what we, we did next was we delivered both cabotegravir and rilpivirine to the same animals because these drugs are given together for treatment. And we looked at the plasma levels over time. And what we found was again with rilpivirine, the microneedles performed better than the, the injection. And we had, even after 70 days, still were above the therapeutic plasma level. 
And with Cabot Hegrevier, we again saw a similar pattern to before where the microneedles perform well, but, but the plasma levels aren't just as high as the injection. So that was with a single dose of both drugs. But we then also did multiple dosing where we either give a bolus dose with an injection and then every 14 days applied the microneedles or we give a bolus dose with the microneedles and again topped up the plasma levels with the microneedles. So you can see that we're able to maintain the plasma levels with the microneedles uh, when they're ap applied repeatedly. And one important point was that we didn't cause any problems to the skin so that the skin um, after the end of the 42 day period was not damaged by repeated application of the microneedles and the animals um, were perfectly healthy. So we think that um, delivery of HIV drugs, particularly if we can now move to more potent compounds, can actually be a realistic treatment and prevention strategy for HIV, and that this will um, take a lot of risk out of the treatment in developing countries, and will mean that people can manage the disease or prevent it in their own homes, instead of having to walk for two days every month to get an injection. And I actually think um, in the current situation, keeping otherwise healthy people out of healthcare settings in the age of COVID is a good idea. Um, so that person's not going to get COVID in the healthcare setting. They're not going to bring it in either if they can manage their disease or prevent disease at home. So I think this can be important. The next condition I'm going to talk to you about is lymphatic filariasis which is a, ne a neglected tropical disease caused by a parasite that also has a bacteria in its intestine. And basically um, it causes um, damage to the lymphatic system um, leading to swollen limbs and can be quite disabling as a result of that. So WHO um, recommends mass drug administration of antalmintics, um, but the problem um, actually is that that's only effective against the parasite in the bloodstream, but it's not effective against the parasite in the lymph node, which is where all, all the damage is actually done. So what we, we want to do is we want to find a way of targeting the lymphatic system. And actually it's known that if you use lipid-based nanoparticles with a particle size of less than 100 nanometers, then you can passively target the lymphatic system. And intradermal injections with a needle and syringe are very difficult to perform and they can only deposit about 0.1% or about 0.1% um, in terms of um, 0.1 mils in the skin at any one time. So this is a very, very small amount. But microneedles could potentially be useful for depositing um, quite high amounts of um, solid particles um, that might be able to target the lymph. So this is work done by um, a young Indonesian um, academic, um, Dian Permana, who was, was in the lab at the same time as Delhi. And what he did was he um, formulated the um, antibiotic doxycycline and the anthelmintic compounds diethylcarbamazine, albendazole sulfoxide, and albendazole sulfone into solid lipid nanoparticles. He then put them into microneedles, applied them to the skin of the rats, and at the end of the experiment, we excised the lymph nodes and we compared the, uh, the concentration of the um, drugs in the lymph nodes, um, microneedle delivery to oral delivery. And the only compound that we didn't see a seven or eight fold increase in lymphatic delivery for um, was albendazole sulfone. And the reason for this is that this is a metabolite that's only formed in the liver after first pass metabolism following oral administration. So we think that microneedles, and um, particularly if you can get the particles inside them of the right properties, can target the lymphatic system. So not just for lymphatic filariasis, but also for autoimmune diseases, for um, targeting HIV reservoirs, and also certain cancers and cancer metastases as well. So microneedles have a lot of versatility and can be used for treating a range of different diseases in an advantageous manner. So I've talked a lot about how we can make large patches, but people need to be able to apply them, of course, to make this treatment viable. So we took 10 volunteers 
They applied a large patch that was about 16 square centimeters to their skin. They also applied a small one square centimeter patch to their skin after following suitable instruction. And what we did was we used optical coherence tomography, which is the optical analog of ultrasound to actually scan down into the skin and measure the depth of insertion and also the width of the pore created. And for the large patch, we looked at various different regions of that patch. And what we found was that the insertion depth was identical um, for the large patch as to the small patch and the width of the pore created was the same as well. So this is really promising. It means that people without using any sort of an applicator can apply large patches to their skin. And this opens up delivery of a range of different medicines now for the first time into and across the skin. So it means that delivery of high doses with microneedles is definitely going to be possible. I did mention that most of these drugs would, would have to be given on numerous occasions. So that's probably um, for the HIV drugs weekly or monthly. And um, for other molecules, we would probably have to apply the microneedles every day. So we want to make sure that we understand that the skin will not be harmed by this um, repeated insult where we're puncturing the stratum cranium and entering the viable epidermis and dermis. So what we did was we took some nude but immunocompetent mice and we applied microneedles to their skin um, once a week for five weeks. And we carefully photographed the skin under controlled lighting conditions. And we saw that there was no change in skin appearance. There was no evidence of polymer accumulating under the skin. And when we used transepidermal water loss to measure barrier function, we found that at the end of the study, it was unchanged relative to control. So the skin is not affected by repeated microneedle application. We also looked at immune response and we looked at three microneedle designs here. We looked at an acidic polymer, Gantrez S97, that dissolves in the um, skin to deposit this um, low pH polymer. We also looked at a neutral polymer, PVP, and a swellable polymer that doesn't dissolve in the skin. And we looked at two different needle densities compared to untreated animals. We found there was no measurable increase in immunoglobulin G relative to control at the end of the study, and that needle density had no detectable effect, and there was no significant difference between dissolving and hydrogel forming microneedles. So the microneedles aren't causing any immune response on their own, even though the skin is full of professional antigen presenting cells. We then looked at inflammation, and we found that there was no measurable increase at the end of the five-week study in terms of the interleukin-1 alpha levels relative to control. And needle density had no detectable effect, and the low pH of the Gantrez S97 formulation also had no significant impact. So we're not causing any local or systemic inflammation. And clearly, infection was important to consider too, because we're making holes in the skin, and the skin is normally a barrier to infection. So we measured C-reactive protein, and again, we found that was unchanged relative to control. The animals didn't have any measurable increases in body temperature, and there was no significant weight change in the animals at the end of the experiment. So it shows that repeat microneedle application is likely to be safe. And we've since um, done a, a study, and Delhi may well have been one of the volunteers for this, where we repeatedly applied the hydrogel forming microneedles to the skin of human volunteers every day for a week. And we, we saw very similar results in that there was no adverse effects of repeat application. So I think microneedles have great potential for delivery of high doses of drugs, particularly long acting hydrophobic drugs or drugs we want to target to specific areas in the body. And we can deliver more than one drug from the same system. And this really does have the potential to address a range of global healthcare challenges. I've only actually mentioned two of them here but um, treatment of antibiotic resistant infections without causing any resistance could actually be one of them and management of autoimmune diseases could be another. We still need to do a lot of work on understanding the pharmacokinetics, particularly for long acting drugs or drugs that are targeted to a particular compartment and understanding the difference between animals and humans 
and actually working out what the product or what the actual patch size should be. I've just received a, a grant of over a million pounds from the UK's Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. And in this project, I will be de-risking the delivery platforms in accordance with regulatory advice, basically to show that the microneedle platforms themselves are safe. And then any company wishing to deliver their molecule with our microneedles can just be handed that data and they then only have a relatively short bridging program of work and um, that would be applicable to any drug. So it, it will speed the transition to the market. And as I mentioned, I'm working with LTS Lohman. They have Europe's only manufacturing license for microneedles. Um, and there also are a number of other companies that now can scale up microneedle production. So the products can actually be made. Very soon, we're going to be doing some um, infection studies for HIV in macaque monkeys. And we also plan a clinical trial over the next number of months of the cabotegravir microneedles. We've applied to the US National Institutes of Health for funding for that. Ultimately, I think that microneedles will move to the market sooner rather than later. And, and it is about time because this is a technology that was first described in the literature before I was even born. And um, we do need to see patient benefit. And I think the COVID crisis has accelerated the need for at-home injection systems. And um, so I think very soon we will see the first microneedle product, and then there should be a real explosion of product development thereafter. So that concludes my presentation. All that remains is to thank the various different members of my group, and also um, the many funders that support our work. And of course, to thank you all for your uh, attention. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for your brilliant presentation, Professor Donnelly. So yeah, it brings back uh, with my PhD research about microneedles. Uh, it's nice to learn this again from you today, but then we have to continue to the next session. So we will uh, ask participants to ask these questions. If there are any questions from the participants, you may uh, write it in the chat box or you raise hand to ask in person. Okay, I think I got private message for the question, uh, Professor Donnelly. So from Ms. Kartika Chitra, so the first question is, um, what are drugs requirement so that could be delivered by microneedles? Is there any limit? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good question, Delhi, and um, it's something that, that we think about all the time. And um, I think a lot of people would have said to us, you know, delivery of, of things like cabotegravir and rilpivirine, you know, you'll never do that with microneedles because the monthly dose is hundreds of milligrams. And, um, you know, I've always thought, well, why are we limiting ourselves to one square centimeter patches? You know, why don't we think about patches that are, are close to uh, um, a conventional transdermal patch and then find a way of getting people to apply those. So I think hundreds of milligrams is possible, but you know something with a, 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 a dose like paracetamol of a gram each time for an adult, you know, you're not gonna deliver that with a patch that's anything smaller than the person's torso. So molecules like that, you know, you would say, well, look, you know, it needs to be more potent than that. Um, the other thing that I, I would say is, um, obviously, if you've got very potent substances, then you can make a, a very small patch and that can be easily applied. But if the, the drug substance has a few hundred milligrams, you're going to need to really concentrate the drug into the needles and find a way of getting most of the needle length into the skin because microneedles are, are wider at the top part. Yep. So you need to actually get most of them inserted to actually maximize the dosing. Um, the other important point, and all the pharmacists will know this, is patient use. Um, you have to have something that is reproducible and easy to use because the general public can do crazy, crazy things. And you know, I've had several instances with people who told me their asthma inhaler wasn't working, but whenever you said to them, you know, show us your inhaler technique, they would either not take the cap off and then um, wonder why they were not getting the medicine or they'd spray it out into the room like an air freshener um, and, and then wonder why it didn't work. And one of my undergraduate students actually from Germany was telling me a story about 
how um, her friend's mother had been diagnosed with asthma and the doctor had said, oh, it's probably caused by that new cat that you got. So I'm going to give you this asthma inhaler. So what did she do? She sprayed the poor cat with the inhaler because it was the cat that was causing the asthma. So, so these are the things that, that the general public can do. We need a foolproof system that can be easily applied every time by every person. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. And then still from Ms. Kartika, um, is there any microdose that already in market and are, how far is it from being marketed? Yeah, it's a great question again. Um, there are a number of microneedles on the market for cosmetic purposes. Um, you know, so there's the derma roller, which is basically like a cylinder with lots of titanium needles and it's rolled up and down on somebody's face. So this stimulates blood flow and collagen production. And there are a number of, of um, high hyaluronic acid um, microneedle products that are made in Korea by a company called Micro Hyala. And um, these are, are quite large patches. They're applied to the forehead and the, um, around the eyes. And the idea is that they um, can basically deposit hyaluronic acid in the skin. And this can act as a precursor to collagen as well as swelling and plumping the face so that it looks less um, wrinkled. Now, Delhi obviously doesn't need that because <laughs> he doesn't have a single wrinkle on his face. But um, for, for, for people here, you know, who, who've got very pale skin, their skin gets damaged by the sun and they get quite wrinkled then. And so this is, is something they want to make them look um, more useful. Um, so from, from a cosmetic point of view, as you all know, that it's easier to get a product on the market because the regulatory hurdles yep. aren't so high. Um, but in terms of a pharma product for drug or vaccine, we don't have one yet. There is a company called Zosano Pharma who have been really the pioneers of, of microneedles and they came out of the drug delivery company, Alsa, um, and they um, unfortunately were unable to get FDA approval in the US for their zolmatriptan coated microneedle system because of some differences in plasma pharmacokinetics of the drug. And I actually think that based on the data, it was because they had an uneven coating process. So some microneedles had more drug than others. But um, I, I'm not really entirely sure that, that that's the case. I really hope that the Zosano guys are able to, to address the FDA's concerns and get the, their product on the market. Because once they do that, I think we're going to see an explosion of products reaching the market. Yeah, I think so, right? Because uh, microdose is a very promising approach for enhancing the transdermal technology. And then we have... Uh, Someone raised hand. Yeah, uh, maybe to Dr. Padlina Chani Saputri. You may ask Professor Donnelly in person if you don't mind, please. Okay, thank you, Billy. Uh, thanks for for Brian for your very interesting presentation. Uh, we know uh, the transdermal application is uh, the most popular use of microneedles. But if we read the articles, we are also able to find many studies have been report uh, the advanced delivery for non transdermal application. For example, uh, what, what we call cardiac cell integrated microneedle patch for treating myocardial infarction, also uh, biodegradable microneedles needles for vascular drug delivery for the treatment of ischemic myocardial disease. Uh, the biodegradable uh, microneedle was used to enhance drug delivery to vascular tissue suffering for atherosclerosis, even uh, to increase drug delivery efficiency and to avoid serious side effects, including stent thrombosis. So the antiplatelet agent is not needed again. Uh, so I think uh, this delivery system is very promising for the treatment of cardiovascular disease uh, due to the drug directly targeted at the target. Uh, for this purpose, uh, is the specific characteristic of drug, particularly for endovascular drug delivery, same with transdermal uh, application? And one more, uh, I would like to know your opinion whether we can apply 
the same system uh, on traditional medicine. Okay, maybe yeah. that's all so, my question. Thank you. Yeah, the, thank you, um, Fadlina. Those, those are great questions and, and very interesting as well. I think that we, we probably do need to design microneedles in a different way if we're going to use them in blood vessels or in cardiac tissue. Um, so we probably need to consider the, the size of the actual patch. The material could be important as well because we're going to be leaving it behind inside the body um, and also the height of the needles um, and, and the fact that we'd be using them inside a vessel where things would be quite moist the need to retain their sort of hardness and sharpness long enough to penetrate. Um, and then um, the need to, to release whatever that the active is. In terms of traditional medicines, it's, it's actually a really great question because um, we, we have a, a colleague here um, from Brazil who Delhi will know well, Fabiana, and she's interested in um, delivery of, of some traditional herbal medicines um, using microneedles. Now, I suppose the challenges in, in that case are the same as they are for any herbal medicines, batch to batch variability, um, variability depending on the source of the, the natural medicine and how you, you actually process it. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't take those compounds and make them into microneedles. The challenge of course, is if you've got um, a, a compound or a complex mixture that has insoluble components, you need to control the particle size. Um, if you have a lot of particles in there that are greater than 10 micrometers in size, your microneedles will be inhomogeneous and some of them may not even come out of the mold. So you, you probably have to do a particle size reduction exercise as well. Okay, so for the isolated one, maybe can be uh, approved. It could be a, a whole area. Yeah. Research, you know, and, and, and that could be something maybe that, that you guys with the expertise that you have in traditional medicines, you know, perhaps, you know, you could could produce some papers in that area. And, and you know, that, that would be something that would be of, of a lot of interest, I think, in the literature to see, you know, not, you know, non-conventional, um, you know, small molecule drugs or, or biomolecules. Um, traditional medicines delivered in that way. It, you know, there would be a range of different papers could be published on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fadlina, for the question. Also yes. for the answers from, from Professor Donnelly. Uh, I hope that the students from postgraduate research or yeah, from Faculty of Pharmacy can ask some questions to the inventor of hydrogel forming microneedles here. Yeah, for your information, Professor Ryan Donnelly is the inventor of hydrogel forming microneedles. So yeah, we are still waiting for questions from the participants. But then uh, while we waiting for the questions, I think I will ask some, some questions, Ryan. Um, it's very interesting to develop microneedles, but then in terms of the geometry that you have explained to us, uh, is there any differences between the conical or pyramidal and this the cuboidal and the pyramidal itself? Yeah, I suppose Delhi, this is is something that um, you know has never been systematically looked at. Um, you know, so. I think a lot of the time when pharmaceutical companies come along and they, they want you to deliver their drug with microneedles, they expect that you just go to um, a shelf and you go, oh, there's the delivery system you need. Here you go. When in reality, um, you know, you have to develop the system for every medicine individually. And, and actually, there's never been a systematic study that's been able to say, right, this is the ideal geometry of microneedles. Um, you know, from a fundamental point of view in terms of insertion into the skin, 100% of those needles go in every time and at least 80% of their length goes beneath the stratum corneum. It's never actually been done. And, and you'll know yourself from your own reading, Delhi, there's been a few papers on modeling of insertion where you look at the biomechanics of the skin, the geometry of the microneedles, the force and speed of application. But there's never been a systematic study. And this is why now working with the Ganta Das at Loughborough University and LTS, we, we have this Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council grant to look at that for the first time. So we'll use the Ganta's 
mathematical modeling, and then we will be doing um, physical experiments um, in terms of insertion to basically try and optimize microneedle design um, so that you can basically say, well, you know what, this is the, the best design that's going to insert um, for each type of material, because remember the material properties are important too, and it's not just the shape. Um, so yes, the, it's something that needs to be done and, and we are going to do it. Okay, thanks for the answer. Um, how about the questions for participants? The students, are there any questions? Okay, um, you, you've talked about the combination of microneedles with the nanoparticles to deliver a, like a lymphatic filariasis drug. Yeah, Diane, my colleague in Belfast. And then is it possible to combine microneedles with other uh, drug delivery systems like uh, vesicles, liposome or something like that? Yeah, you, you, you're right, Deli. And um, we actually have a, a nice visiting scientist from Italy at the moment, and she is putting liposomes into the microneedles. Um, she actually hopes that by using ultra deformable liposomes or known as transfer zones, yeah. that she'll be able to do something similar to what Diane did and target the lymphatic system. So she is planning to load the liposomes into the microneedles and then um, actually um, deliver them and see, can they squeeze into the lymphatic system? But, you know, I think that you can also combine microneedles with other methods of delivery. So I just have a new PhD student from China um, and um, she is going to look now at um, the use of iontophoresis in combination with microneedles. So applying a small electrical current. And if you, you use iontophoresis um, with microneedles, the microneedles will swell quicker and you can push the drug through them um, and deliver a lot more drug and a lot, um, a, a, a lot bigger molecule than with conventional iontophoresis. Um, I, I did have a PhD student in that area about 10 years ago and he was a, a great, great guy. Um, but I do think that there is scope for looking at this um, again. Um, and this is what we're going to actually do with this new student, Lucci, because I think you could do pulsatile drug delivery um, as well as um, accelerating the, the initial dose of delivery. So we can combine a lot of different things um, with microneedles um, and, and deliver a range of different molecules um, with different characteristics. Um, so I think, I think we've only really touched the surface of what can be delivered. And, and you know, very often I find that um, companies will read a paper that we've published and will come to us and say, oh, can you deliver such and such a molecule? We had never even thought of delivering that molecule with microneedles before. So you can learn a lot from industrial projects. Um, at the minute we have a, a project with a big pharma company and we're working with compounds A, B, C, and D. And it's not <laughs> that I can't tell you, it's that they haven't told me what the compounds are. Um, so the whole thing is a, a mystery. Um, and and it, sometimes it can be like this. And um, so you know very little about the molecule and you just have to get a feeling for how it behaves. Um, almost like cooking, which Delhi is an expert in. And um, you, you get a feeling for, for, for how to, to make um, microneedles from a particular material in the same way as when Delhi's making his famous delicacies. Yeah. He, gets, um, he gets an appreciation for how the different ingredients work. Thanks very much for mentioning that, right? <laughs> and yeah, still no questions from the students or the participants. Okay, maybe last question from me, Ryan, because I've been teaching pharmaceutical technology, especially in transdermal technology. And one question from my student was, how could you use tablet or film to deliver something transdermally? Is it possible? I said it possible, but then I think you could explain it well. <laughs> yeah, sure. So there's a couple of different things you can do. So a conventional film, if you apply that to the skin, if the molecule has the right physical chemical properties, then it'll move across the skin. And you know, that films are the basis of, conventional transdermal patches. Um, with a tablet, obviously, if you applied that to intact skin, what you would be relying on then would be um, 
fluid coming from the skin in the form of sweat to dissolve the tablet and then the molecule again to have the correct properties to move across the skin. But of course, as we know, most drugs don't have the properties to move across intact stratum cranium. So what we've done in, in my group, and, and Delhi was, was one of the, the leading um, researchers in this area for the time he was with us, was in delivery of, of medicines using hydrogel forming microneedles. So they basically swell in the skin and you can sit on top of them, a film, a tablet, a lyophilized wafer, um, a hot melt extrudate, and the fluid will be drawn up through the microneedles. It will dissolve the drug reservoir, and then the drug will move down its concentration gradient into the viable skin and can be absorbed by the dermal microcirculation from there. Um, so this actually gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of formulation. So if, for example, you had a drug that was very water insoluble, and then you can make a reservoir that will enhance its solubility, maybe from a hot melt extra date of polyethylene glycol mixture. Or you could you know, do some spray drying of your drug with cyclodextrins and then compress them into a tablet and deliver them that way. And similarly, if your drug was very um, high dose, you could make a lyophilized wafer that's gonna be porous, hygroscopic, amorphous, Fluid gets drawn up and the drug will literally flood through the hydrogel forming microneedles. And that osmotic pull of fluid from the skin will swell your microneedles even more. And this can be really important in, in drug delivery, particularly of high doses. You could also deliver um, something like a, a drug that is very subject to aqueous hydrolysis. And Delhi was involved in, in delivery of antibiotics and very often they aren't terribly stable in water. Um, so you could, you could actually do um, delivery in that way um, from a tablet. So the drug is stored essentially in a tablet, sitting on top of the microneedles, and then it's delivered. Okay, thank you so much for the answer. Hopefully my students yeah, can listen to the answer. And I think we have a question from Dr. Taufik in the Rukmana. Uh, if you don't mind, could you please ask Professor Donnelly in person? Dr. Taufik? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I am in, I cannot. Oh yeah, that's fine. So no, please. Yeah, no problem at all. Okay. So uh, Dr. Taufik is my colleague in Faculty of Pharmacy. Uh, Faculty of Pharmacy. So uh, he asked, what is the diameter size of typical microneedles? How small mm -hmm. it can be? Which size yeah. is the most effective for drug delivery? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, th so this actually touches on, on what we were talking about at the minute uh, or at the beginning. So there's never been a proper systematic study done on optimum microneedle design, but that's what me and my colleagues are going to work on now. But what I would say is if your microneedles are anything less than 300 micrometers in height, you probably need quite an aggressive applicator to push them through the skin. The reason for that is whenever we insert microneedles in the skin, so the skin stratum cranium is like this. So you will bend the skin, you'll bend it, you'll bend it, you'll bend it, and then finally you'll breach it. And then the microneedles are into the viable skin layer. If your microneedles are very short, they're only gonna indent the skin unless you hit it like that, because then the skin will just break without bending. And um, it's almost like if you, if you dive into a swimming pool, as opposed to just doing a big belly flap <laughs> onto the water. And um, 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 that's, the, that's the difference there. So um, typically the diameter at the base of, of, an, of a microneedle that we would make or Delhi would have been working on would be about 300 micrometers at the base. And the reason for that is that they tend to need a bit of mechanical strength um, and, and having a slightly wider base can help you to actually do that. But as I say, we're going to look at this in a, a very um, sci um, scientific way, looking at the biomechanics of the skin and fundamentally studying microneedle geometry and insertion characteristics to try and see, can we actually work out what the, the most efficient uh, microneedle design is? But you know, realistically, there will be a lot of designs that will all be feasible. Okay, many thanks indeed for the answers, uh, Professor Donnelly. Unfortunately, time flies. So yeah, we at the end of the discussion. So again, 
Thanks very much for your brilliant presentations, also the explanations. Hopefully, all the students and participants can learn from this guest lecture. Okay, I think I will give it back to Master of Ceremony, Ms. Ratika. Thank you so much. Thanks, Daddy. Okay, thank you, Prof. Ryan, and also uh, Dr. Daly. Thank you, Prof. Ryan, for excellent and insightful lecture about the advantage of microneedle as drug delivery system, especially uh, for long life treatment, yeah, such as uh, antiretroviral. Okay, uh, hope we all get uh, excellent knowledge and new point of these microneedles. And then um, before we continue to the next session, I would like to remind all of you, the attendants, to fill the attendance list that we have shared in the chat box. Okay, uh, next. Uh, we would like to give an award to Professor Ryan for the excellent lecture by um, delivering the certificate of appreciation. And then I would like to invite again um, uh, Dr. Daly to deliver the certificate. Dr. Daly, please, maybe yeah. you can pin, yeah, uh, Professor okay. Ryan. Thank you so much. Uh, so, Professor Donnelly, we would like to extend our gratitude to you for uh, giving this very insightful lecture today. So please, uh, please receive this uh, certificate of appreciation virtually, of course. Again, uh, yeah, thank you so much for you. Uh, everything you shared today. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Delhi, and thanks everybody for attending. <clears throat> I really appreciate it. I know that you, no doubt you're all busy and, and it's the weekend. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, I hope everything um, continues to improve in, in Indonesia. Um, and that, you know, I'll be able to come and visit Delhi um, at your university, um, as, as we've often talked about. Um, so I look very much look forward to that. Okay, thank you, Professor Donnelly. Okay, thank you so much to Ms. Ratika. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Daly, Prof. Ryan. Finally, we come to the end of this event. May all of us get the value and benefit from this lecture. And uh, thank you very much for all of your kind attention and participation in this webinar. I am Radhika Rahmasari signing off and see you in the next event. Thank you, goodbye, and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ryan.